One of the most interesting facets about a diamond is that when you rotate it, light reflects off of it and reflects through it and shines through it in such a way that as you rotate it, you get different views of it. You get a different understanding of it. You get a different sparkle from it. You get a different inspiration from it. As you rotate that diamond, the light shines in such a way that you can see different things about it. The same is true with scripture stories. You can read a scripture story the same way again and again and again. But then if you focus slightly differently, if you turn your attention to a different aspect of the story, if you look not to the part that always interested you, but to a different part, you discover something new, something fresh, something you had never seen before. That's what my experience has been with the reading uh, from Genesis 2 and 3 this week. This is a very well-trodden story. It's one that we all know. We remember it from Sunday school class as a child. We remember seeing uh, depictions of it in picture books about the fall. And we remember hearing about the fall. And we remember realizing and wondering, why would they do this? Why would they eat of the tree that God said do not eat? And we realize when we ask that question that we are exposing ourselves to the very point of the story. So often this story is used. So often the story of the fall is used to beat. Frankly, it's used to beat on everybody, but especially used to beat on the women folk. You women folk, and it usually involves the taking of a great big floppy Bible like this one, and the shaking of it and saying, you evil women. (laughs) You evil women. Look what you did to us. You tempted us. You tempted us to go astray. And had we been in the garden by ourselves, we wouldn't have fallen. Yeah, right. I don't believe that one for an instant. Thank you. Quite frankly, if anybody comes off in this story as being an absolute stupid idiot, it's the earth creature, the Adam, the man. But it, that's the wrong point. That's the usual way of reading this story. Let's look at it slightly differently. I often ask the question, what was the fall? Now, first of all, the word fall does not occur in the biblical text. Neither does the phrase original sin occur in the biblical text. Frankly, the word sin doesn't occur in the biblical text. However, I I do agree that in a sense, those concepts are present here, even if not spelled out completely. But where in the story is the fall? Augustine, one of the early church fathers, Bishop of Hippo, Augustine, back in the 4th century, identified the fall with sex. Huh? Where's sex in the story? I don't see sex in the story. Do you see sex in the story? Do you see sexual activity going on in the story? I don't see children being begotten. I don't see any of that kind of stuff going on. It doesn't say you can eat of every tree in the garden of Eden. Except you can't go over there and have sex underneath that tree. over there. No, it doesn't say that. I think Augustine's problem stems from the part of the passage where it says, and they were naked. And Augustine had a hang up with sex. He had his own guilt from his childhood and his youth. He was a rather rambunctious and promiscuous youth and he knew it. And that was his original sin, maybe. But I don't see it in the biblical story. I don't see sex. I don't even see nakedness as the sin in the original story. I see it as the revelation 
at multiple levels, not just physically naked, but spiritually naked. In fact, that's the more important nakedness in the entire account. No, it's not sex. Sorry, Augustine, you were a brilliant church father, you were a brilliant bishop, you were a brilliant theologian, but you were wrong. And it's not about listening to women. It might be about listening to snakes. I mean, you know, think about it. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that God, that the Lord God had made. Crafty. Another possible translation for that word crafty is prudent, intelligent, wise, um, understanding. Now that's weird. Not just a negative kind of crafty shiftiness, but prudent, seeing, knowing, understanding, recognizing and realizing. And notice it's that the Lord God had made. When the Lord God made the serpent, quite literally, when the Lord God made the snake, God said, it's good. Huh? I don't like snakes. <laughs> snakes just give me the ugh, squinchies. I, I, they make me uncomfortable. I don't like snakes. When I go out in the camping, I haven't been out camping in ages, but when I go out camping, I avoid snakes like plague. Go out fishing with dad on a float trip down the Mountain Fork River with my dad in a canoe, and we'll be sitting there, and dad will see this snake going across the surface of the water. And he'll go, oh, snake. Ah! <laughs> and he would do it just to see me go. Ah! Snakes just make me. <laughs> I don't like them. I want to stay away. Snake confront me, there'd be a great shaped hole in the wall trying to get away. I don't like them. Something biblical maybe in that not liking about snakes. Well, this is a talking snake. This is an intelligent snake. It's a crafty snake. And it was good. Now, what it says to the woman is not necessarily good. But the snake is good. And the people are good. The earth creature that God created was Good. And man and woman, God created them. They were good. Where's the problem? Where's the fall in this story? I think it's a place that is rarely looked to in Scripture. Compare two sets of verses. And the Lord God commanded the earth creature... You may freely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now compare that with the reiteration given by the woman in chapter 3. The snake asks, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, and notice in my Bible, this now starts in quotes. You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, for you shall die, unquote. Now, is that what God said? Is the woman accurately recounting what God told them? Is the woman correctly attesting to what God's direction was relative to the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden? Is she accurately recounting what God said? No. Huh? Yes, she is. No, she's not. 
she is doing something that we all do. She is doing something that we as children have all done, always done. We as people do every day. She's adding to the word of God. Where is she doing that? Notice what God said again. You may freely eat of the tree, of every tree of the garden, but, verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. Woman's recounting of that is, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it. Oops. Did God say you can't touch the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden? No. Nope. God said you, you shall eat of it. You shouldn't eat of the tree of the knowledge. Of, oh, you're just making a mountain out of molehill, Greg. What's so important about this? She's making it harder. She's making it more difficult. As if she knows better than God that the temptation is so great to eat of this tree that you shouldn't even touch it. For that will increase its temptation quality. Hmm. 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 I believe that the original sin, I believe that the fall, as it were, comes when these archetypal creatures, these earthlings, these earth creatures, decide that they know better than God and therefore they're going to add to God's commandment. Not only you shall not eat of the tree, but you can't even touch it. We see this again and again and again. In conjunction with the Ten Commandments, it comes with the saying of the Lord's name. The Hebrew people were in such awe of the majesty of the name of God that they made it against the law even to speak the name. Now the law says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That's one of the Ten Commandments. And they took that to mean you shall not even speak it at any point in time. You cannot say Yahweh, period. Only the high priest at one time, at one point in any given year, when he's on the Holy of Holies and he's making restitution for the sins of the people, then he can say under his breath very quietly, Yahweh in the prayer. But otherwise you couldn't say it at all. I, I, I think that piece of steak was good enough for Yahweh. You can't say that. You can't say, Yahweh, we bless you. You've got to say, Lord, we bless you. Even though the scripture says, Yahweh, your God, made this, that, or the other, you can't say, Yahweh, your God. You've got to say, the Lord, your God. Otherwise, you'll get a little too close to saying the Lord's name in vain. Something very similar is happening here. She's making it harder. She's saying, don't even touch it. For in the day that you do, you'll die. But God didn't say that. She's adding to the word of God. And to me, in my reading, that's the essence of the fall. And it's the essence of the fall for us all. A desire to know more than God. Remember, it's the eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A desire to come to, be, to become your own master. Your own determiner of what is right and wrong. Your own boss. Your own parent. It is a desire to become the arbiter of good and evil for yourself. Eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... It's essentially saying, God, we love you, and you told us not to eat of this tree, but we want to know what good and evil is for ourselves. Therefore, we want to eat from this tree. So we can have that understanding for ourselves. And even before doing so, 
they've already started to make that proclamation by saying, we can't even touch it. This is what I call an archetypal story. It's what Old Testament scholars have called archetype for a long time. It speaks not so much about a literal event in history as it speaks about the character and the nature of human beings in general. We are children born of an eternal parent. We have this eternal parent, this father, this eternal mother who loves us, who cares for us, who nurtures us, who protects us, who feeds us, who provides everything that we need. We have no needs, no wants. We live in a garden where everything is taken care of. We can eat of all the trees of the garden. We only have one tiny little restriction. Don't eat of one particular tree. And it's easy to tell which tree it is. It's in the middle of the garden. Don't eat of that particular tree. Trust me in everything else. Trust me in everything and you will be okay. Don't eat of this tree. Eat of everything else and you'll be fine. And we, being the children that we are, find it impossible to deal with that one no. We find it impossible to accept the idea that God would know a little bit better than us and accept that no. And instead, we begin by saying, oh, it's even worse. We can't even touch it. We can't even say God's name. And then when they actually do eat of the tree, they recognize that they're naked, that they are actually without recourse, that they are in trouble and there's nothing they can do about it. You can't hide it. I have been owned, you own dogs and you've been owned by cats, okay? You don't own a cat. I've been owned by cats and I have noticed that as they are kittens, and this actually lasts even into adulthood, if they make a mess on the middle of the floor, They'll try to cover it up. There's nothing there to cover it up with. But they'll still go through this action to try to cover it. That's what Adam and Eve are doing in this story. That's what the earth creatures are doing. They're trying to cover up their spiritual nakedness, their spiritual weakness and inability to do anything with these fig leaves. And we do the same thing. We all fall. We all stumble into sin. When we think that our meager understanding and our meager abilities suffice and actually go beyond God's abilities and God's understanding. And when we think we know more than God to even extend the law further and say, nor shall you touch it. We have stumbled into sin. When we set up rules and regulations for other people, and we do not live those rules and regulations ourselves, we've stumbled into sin. When we pretend as though we understand the ways of God, when we think we have understood this passage and we've sussed it out, we have it entirely understood, and we know what it's about, it's about sex, we've stumbled into sin. Without humility and understanding that there are some things that we just do not grasp physically, spiritually, metaphorically. When we come to that realization that there are some things that we do not get, we actually encounter the reality of our existence. Now, there is a sense in which when, when the earth creatures, when the earthlings ate of the tree, they recognized their nakedness. They did indeed experience a spiritual awakening, a, a spiritual growth. But that spiritual growth robbed them of the opportunity, therefore, to live in this blessed state yeah. in the garden. Now they've got to go out in the world. They've got to plant fields. They've got to work hard for their food. They can't just pick it off of a tree easily, willy-nilly. They've got to work hard. 
Which would you rather do? Plow a field, harvest the food, prepare it and eat it, or walk around and say, well, we can eat of every single tree that we see here except that one right there. Or, you know, it doesn't depict any childbirth prior to this event, but the, the penalty f for giving childbirth is to come very close to death in the process. If only we'd stayed in the garden. I've heard that stated many times. If only we'd stayed in the garden. Well, in a sense, yes. But in a greater sense, we didn't. We grew up. And that's where you kind of get to the whole point of the story. We were children. We were given simple boundaries. We stumbled over those boundaries. We tried to make the boundaries even bigger and stumbled over them anyway. And in so doing, we grew up, recognized our spiritual, metaphorical, and physical nakedness, tried to hide ourselves, and failed. We grew up. This story speaks about the pain and the anguish, the sadness of growing up. And you know, as much as I'd love to go spend a day or two in that garden, in the end, I much prefer being grown up. <gasps> you much prefer having fallen? Yeah, I do. Because this allows then for a mature relationship to be established. Recognizing that in the end we are just as helpless as they were in the garden in reality. But because of what and who Jesus is. Because God makes a provision to overcome this tendency to think we know better than God. And this desire to become God. God makes provision in Jesus Christ becoming one of us. That's the interesting irony here. We make this attempt to become like God. And the answer to it, the answer to this original sin, is for God to become one of us. So that he may die for us. Solve the breach that we have dug here with our desire to be like God. And in so doing, make it possible for us to grow up, trust in the love of God in Christ Jesus. Enter into an adult relationship with our creator. Recognizing we are not the creator, we are still the child. But now we face God with our Savior Jesus, joint heirs with him, and enter into the kingdom, no longer as children, but with the opportunity of being an adult and living by faith. Oh, I'd love to spend a weekend in the garden. but we will spend eternal, eternity not in this garden but at the banquet with Jesus with God with each other yes I'm happy that we've grown up sometimes we don't act like we've grown up we still do the exact same things that they did then we have the opportunity to turn to Christ, accept the love and the grace offered there, recognize that we cannot by ourselves do it. All we make is little fig leaves. All we can do is trust in God to clothe us with his righteousness. And we will live eternally. listening to 
a sermon by Dr. Gregory Neal, Senior Pastor of St. Stephen United Methodist Church and Rector of Grace Incarnate Ministries. Copyright 2011 by Dr. Gregory S. Neal. All rights reserved.